Tonight, on The Good, The Bad, and The Unknown, Charles Nelson Riley gets blocked, gets slammed, and gets on stage. Roll the intro. Hello, boys and girls. This is your old friend, Andre City, and I'm back with another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Unknown, where I take one uh, entertainer, we'll call them, and I find one work of theirs that I like, one work of theirs that I don't, and one that not many people know about. And today, I am very excited because we're talking about a man that I have been in love with since I was a little boy, and is perhaps the reason I'm even wearing these glasses with no frames. I'm talking about this fella, this Huckleberry over here, the wonderful Charles Nelson Riley. That's not an autograph picture to me. It's in fact dated October 1988. I was not even one year old. Uh, it was a gift from David Arquette, who knows how much I love this man, and he loves him too, and a lot of people love him, and, and it's very odd, strange, because most people only know him from one thing. Um, he was a, a famed celebrity panelist on Match Game, almost always, and he would always sit in the top right corner, and he would have a pipe and an ascot and a toupee and wonderful glasses, and he would make <clears throat> snide remarks, a la perhaps a Paul Lind in Hollywood Squares, but he was much, much more than that. He was uh, originally trained by the iconic Uta Hagen, and he went on in Broadway. He was in Bye Bye Birdie, and the original cast of How to Succeed in Business without really trying, and uh, he went on to direct a lot of opera, a lot of theater. He was in a lot of movies like uh, Cannonball Run 2, and uh, became very good friends with Burt Reynolds. They had an acting school together, and was also, you may know him as one of the voices in All Dogs Go to Heaven. He, he voiced that along with uh, Dom DeLuise and Burt Reynolds. And of course, uh, you may remember that Weird Al wrote a song about him. However, most people know him as answering questions on Match Game, which I will say he did a phenomenal job at. However, that is merely the tip of the eclectic iceberg that is the work of Charles Nelson Riley. Also, I want to say, pretty much everything on this list could be considered un unknown. It's always for one reason or another. It's like, this didn't work because of this. But nevertheless, uh, just bear with me. Uh, let's go beyond the match game. Let's go behind the blank, if we will. Now, the good for me is an entry that initially, the first time I saw it, I thought, well, this has to be horrible. But then I watched it, and I fell in love with it. And it is a 1975 uh, live-action slash animated TV show children's block thing called Uncle Croc's Block. Uh, Charles Nelson Riley plays Uncle Croc. He is a crocodile who is, who is hosting this show. I mean, he's a crocodile. He's a man with a crocodile head on. And uh, he's aware that he's hosting the show. It's very meta. He hates hosting the show. Uh, which is fantastic to me. Uh, Alfie Weiss voiced his rabbit sidekick, Mr. Rabbit Ears. And Jonathan Harris was in the show as the show's begrudging director, Basil Bitterbottom. And Jonathan Harris, you may remember as Dr. Smith from the wonderful Lost in Space. So, yeah, I mean, at first you go, this is a horrible idea. And then when you hear that Jonathan Harris is in it, you're like, these two work together for I don't know how many episodes, one season-ish. Um, so it was very a show within a show, and uh, they interspersed uh, little an animated shorts, animated series like they would at the time. It would air like maybe like a Saturday morning kind of thing. But every episode, a motorcycle riding bird named Cuckoo Knievel, which is, of course, a parody of, of Evil Knievel, uh, he would burst out, he was a puppet, he would burst out of the clock and say it was star time, and a celebrity guest uh, would come out, and they would, of course, be a parody of uh, celebrity guests. But they were played by um, a lot of good people. So let, let me read you the list, and then you'll see why I love this show. Captain Clangaroo, okay? Uh, Mr. Mean Jeans, which is a parody of, of Mr. Green Jeans from uh, Captain Kangaroo, was played by Hunt Hall. Uh, who else was here? Sherlock Domes, Carl Ballantyne. Uh, and Dr. Watkins, played by Stanley Adams. Witchy Goo Goo, played by Phyllis Diller, which is interesting because she was um, a parody of Witchy Poo from H&R Puff and stuff. And then Charles Nelson Riley would go on to star in Lidsville, 
another Croft Brothers. Uh, this was not produced by the Croft Brothers, even though you would think it, it would. It even went up against uh, Far Out uh, Space Nuts with uh, Bob Denver. Uh, who else is here? Junie the Genie, played by Alice Ghostly, who is a teenage genie. She's a parody of uh, I Dream of Genie, obviously. Billy Braxton, played by Marvin Kaplan as Captain Marbles. It's a parody of, of Captain Marvel. This one is my favorite. Robert Ridgely played Steve Exhaustion, the $6.95 man, which was, of course, a parody of Steve Austin and the $6 million man. Old Bear was a, de uh, a depressed Yogi Bear. Uh, Miss Invis was a woman who falsely claims to make herself invisible. And then the cartoons in the middle was a thing called Mush, which stood for Mangy Unwanted Shabby Heroes. They were sled dogs uh, in a parody of M.A.S.H. And another one was Frady Cat and, and Wacky and Packy, a prehistoric caveman and his pet Woolly Mammoth, both voiced by Alan Melvin and up trapped in modern times. <clears throat> so uh, I loved the show. I thought it was hilarious. However, there are... It, it was a good throwback in a certain way in the sense that, especially nowadays, you never see adults hosting kids shows anymore you really really don't especially for that age they seemed very old here jonathan harris seemed very old certainly phyllis diller was and it's also for a very specific audience because it's aimed at kids but they require you to have a knowledge of popular adult tv shows like the six million dollar man so i think it was to me it was aimed at a smarter child and perhaps was a precursor to me of a of even a peewee's playhouse or Steam Pipe Alley starring Mario Cantone, which I'm sure we'll get to at some point. Uh, but here's why it was not loved by everyone else. Uh, the show, which was fitted with an adult laugh track, uh, was shortened to 30 minutes after a couple episodes, then scrapped on February 14th, 1976, after half a season on the air on Valentine's Day. Uh, ABC president Fred Silverman, that's before he was at NBC, severed all ties with Filmation, who produced the show, and then began commissioning its Saturday morning cartoons from Hanna-Barbera. So that's how Hanna-Barbera moved over uh, from CBS to ABC, which is, is fascinating. The other issue is that maybe it was parroting what it was supposed to be. You know, it was very knowing. It was very smart. You can look at it and see why it won't work then, but it certainly works now. So I encourage you to check it out. So that is the good Uncle Croc's blog. The bad for me is a 1987 movie, a wrestling comedy called Body Slam. Uh, if you're not familiar uh, uh, with this movie, it's one of the unsung uh, wrestling movies, and honestly for good reason. It was directed by Hal Needham, who uh, was like Burt Reynolds' guy for a while. He directed The Longest Yard. He directed Smokey and the Bandit, Cannibal Run and Two, which makes sense why Charles Nelson Riley is even in this. But it stars, listen to this cast, uh, Dirk Benedict, Roddy Piper, Tanya Roberts, Sam Fatu, better known as the rest of the Tonga Kid, and Captain Lou Albano, who always seemed to find his way into any wrestling or, or any movie or TV show about wrestling, always had Captain Lou Albano for some reason. The film revolves around a down and out music promoter who inadvertently becomes a successful pro wrestling uh, manager. He tries to promote concerts and then he gets a wrestler confused with a musician and this whole thing happens and they're like, why don't you, you're good at this. Uh, why don't you become a wrestling manager? So it goes into there. The film features many known, uh, well-known wrestlers at the time and references the rock and wrestling era of professional wrestling. Obviously, a weird, weird thing uh, in this is that Roddy Piper is in it. He's basically the co-star. However, not as Roddy Piper. He plays quick Rick Roberts, and he's the nicest guy on the planet. He's the biggest baby face in the world, and it's jarring to see and just an all-around Horrible choice, but of course this is this whole thing is is filled with it. Uh, Dirk Benedict plays M. Harry Smilak. Uh, who else is in the movie? Uh, Captain. Okay, Captain Lou Albano. I want to talk about this. His name in the movie. He's a wrestling manager, and he's called Captain Lou Morano. That's some great, great writing there. 
And Sam Fat 2, who's always known as the Tonga Kid in wrestling, plays Tonga Tom. And him and Quick Rick Roberts are a tag team, which makes no sense. And that's why this really uh, falls on its face, is because they seem to have no clue what the deal is uh, with wrestling as all, uh, at all. Charles Nelson Riley plays uh, Vic. Vic, where's his name? I have it down here. Stay with me. Stay the course. Uh, Vic Carson, um, who hosts a talk show, the hottest wrestling talk show called Ring Talk. Uh, very exciting. Also, I'd be remiss if I did not mention Billy Barty, the famed little person actor, is in this movie. And also, John Astin has a cameo as a car dealer. So what was the issue with this film? Well, there was a lot of infighting that I think prevented its release. Hal Needham had arguments uh, with the pair that produced and wrote the film regarding his changes to the script, regarding in, uh, resulting in lawsuits that delayed the film's release. As a result, the film was never theatrically released and was instead released direct-to-video. So, even as a wrestling film, uh, not a lot of wrestling fans know about it. This is a real good reason why. Uh... In an interview uh, with the Canadian Online Explorer, a wonderful publication, Dirk Benedict recounts positive experiences working on the film. However, both he and director Hal clashed with the two lawyers credited with writing and producing the film, they sound like a fun bunch, over changes to the script and Needham's creative choices. At one point, Benedict had a physical altercation with one of the writers and producers. These conflicts led to lawsuits being filed, which caused the film to miss the entire summer movie season. Uh, so that was the problem. Uh, later, the film was slated to be released by the Hemdale Film Corporation. However, the film never saw a wide release and was released directly to VHS. But in 2011, Body Slam was brought uh, to DVD as part of the MGM Limited Collection series. So if you really want to watch it, it's out there. Uh, none of it looks very good. Uh, and the, the whole film is not that good. I mean, it's fine in a sense, but it's one of those things where it's like... You have to assume wrestling is real. If you do, if you don't, they, you'll just you'll never get through it. It's one of those weird things where like, oh yeah, everything else is fake, but wrestling's real, right? You're a real manager. Also, uh, nice cameos by wrestlers. The Barbarian is in it, and classy Freddie Blassie is seen sitting in the front row, and that should not be ignored. Uh, it's weird. Uh, if you enjoy this weirdness, you may enjoy it. However, uh, uh, in terms of Charles Nelson Riley's work. Perhaps not the best. So the good was Uncle Croc's block. Uh, the bad was Body Slam. And now uh, for the unknown. The unknown is something that's actually also uh, very, very good. And it was a little movie uh, of a stage play of a one-man show called The Life of Riley, which was uh, Charles Nelson Riley's one-man show and his, his final show. Uh, he was 70 years old at that point, which would be 2006. Uh, so it was a film adaptation of his one-man play called Save It for the Stage, The Life of Riley. It was written by uh, Charles Nelson Riley, as you know, and Paul Link. And uh, it was filmed before live audiences uh, in Hollywood in 2004. Uh, the final film is compiled from Riley's final two performances, which is the last time he ever performed in front of an audience, which is just a fantastic little thing. And, of course, they, they use uh, clips and images of his life and music and uh, it premiered at South by Southwest in 2006 to positive reviews and played for over a year on the festival circuit. And then a limited theatrical release began in November 2007. Uh, <clears throat> the play was based upon lectures that Riley uh, had been giving to college theater students. And he extrapolated it and turned it into this wonderful, wonderful show. He took it around the country also, including San Francisco uh, and New York. And it was nominated for a Drama Desk Award in 2001 and an Outer Critics Circle Award. Uh, the film begins with Riley recounting his childhood and his parents in New York City and Connecticut. It doesn't get too much into his celebrity uh, life. Uh, it's really more about his childhood and coming up in the business and trying to make it. But, you, so you think, ah, this is terrible. I want to hear about Match Game. Uh, but when, when you hear about what these things are, they become very endearing, very fascinating. Uh, we meet his family, an institutionalized father, uh, a racist baseball bat-wielding mother, and a lobotomized aunt, among others. So uh, Charles Nelson Riley's father uh, worked for Paramount Pictures as an illustrator and like an animator. And this guy who worked there 
uh, wanted to go into business with him. And he said, let's let's make the first animated film in color together. Let's do this. I want to move to California. And uh, Charles Nelson Reilly's mother said, no, I'm not letting you go and blah, blah, blah. So they ended up not going. And that man uh, who wanted to be partners with Charles Nelson Reilly's father turned out to be a young Huckleberry himself called Walt Disney. Uh, Charles Nelson Reilly was also allegedly attended the great... Circus Fire. If you know your circus history, you know what I'm talking about. He was there, which was fascinating. Um, it's it's fascinating. Uh, his his life was very fascinating, and it's a wonderful way for him to perform uh, as himself. And it's a good look to see that he's you know uh, smarter and perhaps deeper, and sees that that so much more is there than what you simply see on Match Game. Although that's not that bad. Um, the Life of Riley was filmed uh, in front of a live audience. Riley was ill at the time with chronic asthma and was forced to cancel one of his three performances. So the bulk of the final film was shot on the final night's performance, uh, which would turn out to be the last time Riley performed uh, on stage. Additional materials filmed during rehearsals, blah, blah, blah. Theatrical release. Okay, so this is why it's kind of very unknown. Life of Riley received a regional theatrical release in the U.S. and Canada in 2007 and 2008 to very positive reviews, but limited box office, and it did not receive a DVD release. In 2009, the filmmakers announced that the film had been slated for release by the New Yorker Films, but was indefinitely delayed due to the bankruptcy of the distributor. Uh, and then it was released uh, in 2010 on a two-disc Blu-ray, which is still difficult to get. Uh, the set includes the th theatrical release, a three-hour length stage version of the play, a making of featurette and a feature length documentary with Burt Reynolds and Mira Jelly S Jerry Stiller and of course Dom DeLuise, which I have not seen. Uh, it was hard to track this down. This uh, Life of Riley been trying to track it down for years, and then I had a friend who actually worked on the post production of it. I'm putting on a DVD, and he was able to give me a copy, and I loved it. I fell in love with it, and I bequeathed it uh, to Mario Cantone so he could see it. We all had real difficulty. Finding this, and I urge you, if you have the opportunity to, go see it. Um, and if you want more proof as to why, after its release, Life of Riley uh, got a 100% fresh rating from Rotten Tomatoes, and it was listed as the best reviewed film of 2007. Why aren't we all talking about this, and why are we not all running out right now and beating down doors and getting ourselves a copy of Life of Riley? And respecting this man not only for who he was on Match Game, but who he was everywhere else. So the good was Uncle Croc's block. The bad was Body Slam. And the unknown, but now you know, was the life of Riley. I am RJ City, and this is what I've chosen to do with my life. Guests of the RJ City Show, subscribe to his channel, follow him on social media, and buy his t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com slash RJ City.